Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Resuming Debate podcast. I'm your host, Member of Parliament, Garnet Jettis. This is a place where we try to have long form, substantive, serious, uh, thoughtful conversations about the issues of the day. Uh, we have people on from, from different partisan backgrounds. And um, and what a time to be alive. Uh, what a, what a what a uh, powerful moment this is in Canadian politics. Uh, we have just found out that the Prime Minister is invoking the Emergencies Act, something that hasn't been done in Canadian history. Uh, and this is kind of part of this escalation that ultimately comes out of a vaccine mandate, something that we're going to be uh, digging into today. Uh, we have an Emergencies Act being brought in to respond to uh, protests, protests that uh, are in in uh, many places in involving people protesting peacefully, uh, but have also involved uh, very serious blockading of critical infrastructure by small numbers of people. Uh, I, we in, in my party have been clear about uh, supporting the right to protest, uh, supporting calls for an end to, uh, to federal mandates, uh, but uh, opposing uh, and I think consistently opposing the blockading of, uh, of critical infrastructure. Um, but for our conversation today, we're, we're talking about uh, specifically the issue of, of mandates in the context of employment, tracing this controversy back to, to its source, to the thing that, that spawned these, these protests in the first place, which is, I think, this, this general phenomenon we've seen of, of people arguing that those who choose not to get vaccinated should face employment related consequences uh, and we have we have uh, people in the private sector uh, people at various levels of government uh, being being fired or prevented from working as a result of federal mandate so uh, i am very pleased to be joined uh, by my friend andrew monkhouse the uh, the creator uh, and um, and what do you say in law you don't, you don't say owner you say senior partner or something of of monkhouse law um, i'm I, i'm already outing myself as as a as a a, a serious non lawyer here but you're here to you're here to set me on the right path in terms of uh, of legal information uh, andrew thanks so much for uh, for joining us today uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yes, uh, senior partner, founder, uh, managing partner, um, all of those things. Managing partner more rather just means I also have to handle people's applications to the firm. But uh, yeah, we started off uh, fairly small and now we have 15 lawyers in Toronto. We do a variety of work, a lot of work for employees who have been let go, but also for small and medium sized businesses. And we have a class actions division. Uh, that uh, Alexander Monkhouse, uh, my partner and also wife, uh, heads up as well. And so it's, it's been very interesting during the pandemic with a lot of changing waves of employment law happening all at once. Um, but we've, because we do give out a lot of free information to the public, um, that's something where we've been able to assist them quite a bit in, in getting individualized information about their, about their own situation. So it's, it's been quite interesting, we'll put it that way. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. So you, I was going to ask you to give some background on your uh, on your firm, and uh, and you've done that. So, um, and by the way, full disclosure: Andrew and I went to Carleton University together. Uh, we were involved in some uh, some pretty exciting uh, operations around uh, student politics at the time, and uh, and and Andrew's gone on to be uh, incredibly successful. And um, and you have a, you guys have a a blog and a, a Facebook page and things. You're you've made the choice to uh, yeah to you to to um, share a lot of public information about your perspective on employment law. Um, wh where can people access those platforms and, and what can they find on there? And we'll, we'll, we'll get into the meat of the topic in a moment here, but uh, people may want to follow up if, they're, if they have an interest in this area to just learn more about emerging issues in, uh, in labor law. Yeah, we, we have a blog at uh, monkhouselaw.com and uh, we put that and we try and you know, update it fairly often. We do have other information on the website as well about vaccine mandates and uh, this sort of thing about what your employer can and can't do. Uh, so that way employers or employees can read up on it and make sure that they're on the same page because there's a lot of misconceptions in Canadian employment law. Uh, some of it comes from a variety of sources. One being, I guess, American movies, not to blame American movies, but when you have movies called two weeks notice, it makes people think they can give two weeks notice. And in Canada, for instance, just as an example, that isn't necessarily always the case. So some of these misconceptions make it a bit more difficult. So we try and get information out there. And uh, also our staff are available 
um, by phone uh, to be able to assist people. And you can find the, the link and the information to do that on the website. It's the easiest way. But to be able to help people about their individual circumstance as well. And we generally don't charge for an initial call. So that way people can call in and get information about it. When I started my firm, I really wanted it to be very, um, you know, you know, client centric. So helping out people, um, you know, you don't need to hide information and charge people just to tell them you can't help them. Some people, um, there's a lot of things people want and the law just doesn't allow it. And you could screen that out pretty quickly. So some people do have cases though. And the, the most recent wave has been uh, vaccine mandates for us, at least at this point. It's uh, sort of the third wave initially in the, uh, with the pandemic, there was a temporary layoff wave where a lot of people were temporarily laid off. Then there were mask mandates. And now the most recent one has been vaccine mandates. And we yet to see, so we have waves, I guess, just like the pandemic has waves in terms of the sociological response to the pandemic as well and how it affects people's work and their, their uh, livelihood. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, uh, let's drill into that. The, the second and third wave, you know, the first wave people being, being temporarily laid off, uh, you know, that's not, that's not related to um, to personal choices. That's just related to the the state of the the economy and and wider events. But whether it's masks or or uh, vaccination, um, how legitimate is this phenomenon of people being uh, punished, uh, quote unquote, you know, or or, or facing employment related consequences uh, for behaviors that that may or may not be workplace related? Um, can can an employer at any point? create a new rule for the workplace that that uh, excludes some people uh, does that rule have to be justified according to some uh, some criteria um, what's uh, what's kind of the, the, the general labor law around uh, around those kinds of decisions yeah it's, it's interesting so I mean generally there's two types of employees there's unionized and non-unionized employees in general uh, those are the two large groups um, and, and the law affects them differently. So for, for unionized employees, it's a bit different because in most unionized settings, employers are able to make reasonable policies and those policies are able to be enforced. Um, and by in non-unionized settings, each individual employee has an agreement with their employer. So in unionized settings, for instance, a union could agree, let's say that vaccination was required, and then there isn't a huge amount that employees can do about it. Whereas in, in, their, in their individually employed, they can more rather uh, fight out those battles themselves rather than having to go through the union. Most of what we've seen thus far, just because of a backlog in the courts and also the complexity of the issue, has been unionized cases that have come out. Generally, you know, there's been some mixed results, but the majority have upheld vaccination policies. Now, that is different than upholding that you're allowed to terminate someone and not pay them any severance uh, for not getting vaccinated. So those fights generally haven't been determined as of yet. Um, most of the time, the policies that have been upheld, again, in the unionized environment, which often is a higher standard, or more difficult for um, you know, these things to be, uh, to be overturned, it, they have to be reasonable. A lot of them are fairly reasonable that are being taken forward. For instance, they allow for rapid testing as an alternative. Those um, and the people have to be physically present. Um, so the ones that we're seeing get defeated are ones that often don't have rapid testing or where they're attempting to apply mandatory vaccine against people's uh, when people are working from home, for instance, which just seems questionable to begin with. So the law hasn't been fully determined yet, but it is a major problem legally to impose new conditions on people once they've started employment. Um, generally, that shouldn't be something that happens. But this is an unprecedented situation, so we don't know which way the court's going to 100% go. Certainly, there are a lot of examples to, for us where we see that people shouldn't be, for instance, terminated and not provided with pay. And I say that because in a non-unionized circumstance, generally the question isn't whether or not the person can be terminated, because almost every non-unionized person can be terminated for any reason that an employer wants, they just have to pay out a reasonable amount of money. That's a compromise that we've made and a pretty good one that's worked in Canada is that you can terminate employees that are not unionized for whatever reason. That isn't discriminatory. It's not racism. It's not sexism. But you have to pay them severance pay. And that's the sort of question that's going to be coming up. Are these workers, are they going to be entitled to sometimes significant severance pay? If someone works there worked at a company for say 30 years they might get two years of severance pay and that's a, a huge amount 
um, of support that they might need in a pandemic situation. So that's where the fight is now, generally. Um, but we have, we're still waiting on some of the first decisions to come out with regard to especially non-unionized employees or even unionized employees about whether or not they get severance pay. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, that's a that's a great overview, and there's a lot of things in there that I wanted to uh, to dig into. Um, first, let's talk about the the unionized employees. So, if, if I understood what you were saying right, it's that um, if you're if you're a member of a unionized workplace, your position is entirely dependent on the agreement that your union uh, negotiates with your employer. And uh, so uh, if, if unions are, or a particular union is, is very on board with the direction that an employer or government is going with respect to, um, with respect to, uh, to mandating vaccination, the individual unionized employer who, employee who may not agree with the decision of their union, uh, they're, they're really stuck. They don't, they, don't, they don't have the same recourse that a non-unionized employee does uh, if their union, from their perspective, isn't on their side. Is that correct? That's correct, right? Unions are, are democratic organizations as well. But so if you think about how the math works, if let's say 90% of people are vaccinated in general, one might assume that 90% of unionized people are also vaccinated and therefore the union potentially knows, you know, the people who are going to be elected then have a feeling or perhaps think that there's a, even if there's a bare majority, that that will help them get elected because these are elected positions. So We have seen cases where employees are upset because the union, they feel effectively sided with the employer in creating a vaccine mandate. And their only recourse is to start something called a duty of fair representation complaint. Um, All of those relating to vaccine mandates that I'm aware of have not succeeded. In general, duty of fair representation complaints have um, something like a 2% success rate in general. So it's it's a really long shot um, in general. And so Yes, that's something that's a concern because, yeah, unionized employees don't have an individual legal relationship with their employer. It's through the collective agreement. Okay, so there's some there's some real trade offs for the individual employee uh, in in that context. Then Um, uh, now you you mentioned uh, this problem of new conditions being uh, implied, uh, applied, uh, being a very different category than than pre-existing uh, condition. So that that makes total sense to me. If if a person is hiring an employee now and they say, you know, you you have to be vaccinated, fully vaccinated in order to start work, and the person says, uh, oh yeah, no problem. And then once they're on the job, you find out they're not fully vaccinated. Uh, presumably that you know that they've misrepresented their status, uh, and and that you know that person doesn't really have any recourse, right? That's right. And there was nothing ever stopping any employer in Canada from uh, from saying you need to be vaccinated or have your vaccines up to date. In fact, we certainly have represented people where they have that in their contracts, say working at daycare. Some day it was very uncommon, but now it is becoming more common. But at least it lets the employer and the employee be on the same page when the employment agreement starts rather than 20 years later suddenly um, they're being told, well, now you have to get vaccines and they're asking about that. And maybe the person has concerns about that. um, And now all of a sudden they're being let go from their 20 year job, which really to some extent hurts them and also hurts the employer. I mean, they're they're losing a 20 year person. um, And, you know, so it's not really good for anyone, but employers feel like they they're required to do this. Sometimes they feel like there's a mandate um, and sometimes the existence of that mandate is is more questionable than one might think. So, so it sounds like it's a minority of cases. But what about those cases where uh, somebody's somebody's contract requires them to be up to date on on vaccinations, um, but the person is particularly nervous about the the COVID nineteen uh, vaccines, which are which are quite new? Because I, I hear this a lot from constituents, people who say I'm not anti vaccination. I have all my childhood vaccinations. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, I'm nervous about this particular one. Uh, what happens to that employee if there's some general vaccination commitment in their in their contract? Uh, well, you go through similar, I guess, uh, instances. You know, you look to whether or not there'd be some sort of medical or religious exemption uh, mm-hmm. to that. Um, you know, technically, any if there is an invalid term. So if someone, for instance, did have a legitimate medical or religious exemption, I just say those two because of the most common theoretically, there could be other exemptions, but not really that I know of. 
And, um, you know, that would get past that agreement, even if that was the case. So someone, for instance, you know, we've had this circumstance where someone says, well, can I sign this agreement? Or should I tell them that I'm going to be saying that I have an exemption? And we say, well, sign the agreement first, then say, well, have, an ex you know, have that discussion afterwards, because there's an implied exception to all of those agreements, um, if it is valid. Now, the difficulty is that um, currently there's been a, a large narrowing in terms of what's accepted as religious and or uh, medical exceptions. Uh, the, um, you know, Ontario, I think the College of Physicians and Surgeons has come out and said that there's, you know, fairly narrow range of what could be accepted for medical. Um, the, the one you outlined is actually one of the, the can be stronger, and that is that you just have a concern. You know, people have a concern that it might be dangerous, even if it might not be well-founded, even if they admit it might not be well-founded, that they say, oh, well, I'm just, I get very very anxious and nervous about getting the vaccine. Um, you know, there are people who are, for instance, afraid of flying. They know that a thousand planes take off each day and land each day safely. And that the chance of, you know, dying in a plane accident is less than that driving to the airport. But yet they're still very scared of it. Um, so that's, you know, how the human mind works. And it is something yes. that we see that a lot of people discount because they say, well, no, we want to we don't want you know, some sort of psychological medical, we want medical saying you're not able to get the vaccine. But if the person you know, can't physically get to the vaccine center, they're having panic attacks, they're having heart palpitations, you know, that is something that is um, you know, much more um, to some extent defensible than someone just saying, well, I don't want the vaccine from a legal basis. But each case is really individual about whether or not, um, you know, about medical exemptions, for instance. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really important uh, point about the fact that uh, you know, of course, as human beings, we we avoid doing things that that for whatever particular reason in our psychology and our experience uh, make make us very fearful. Um, even if, even if we can sort of absent those feelings, rationally deconstruct the the, the fears uh, that that fear and that sort of psychological, uh, emotional, mental health impact is still is still real for us, right? Um, um, yeah, so, so then the, the general case you're talking about though, for, for a lot of people is the non-unionized employee, uh, whose employer brings in a new policy and, uh, and then I, most people are vaccinated, but for, for those in that category who are unvaccinated, uh, they face, they face termination and, um, and what you're saying is legally, uh, the, 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 the way Canadian labor law works in, 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 in most places, in most contexts is if your employer wants to fire you, he or she can um, for almost any reason, but, you know, provided that there's not uh, capital D discrimination according to, according to human rights law, but, but they have to pay you a fair severance. And if it's not based on a pre-existing policy uh, or, or, or something like that, then, then you, uh, you know, you you are entitled to a, a pretty substantial severance in that situation. That's right. Yeah. The, the question is really whether or not the person is going to get their severance. It's not for, for non-unionized employees. It's not about whether or not they're going to get their job back. Generally, it's about whether or not they get paid a severance pay to help them through until they can find a new job. Um, that's the main question for uh, for these folks. But you know, I think that the court cases are probably going to be at least sort of four to six months away. And things are changing rapidly, even with, for instance, this newest wave of Omicron. We've seen from what we see is, is a real moral, uh, a removal of sort of the moral imperative in terms of these vaccine mandates, because one of the, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but one of the things we see time and time again is that Omicron is able to infect people with even three doses. Um you know, maybe not to the same extent, but certainly it's able to in a way that the previous variants weren't. And that, to some extent, removes this moral imperative from employers to say, well, we want to get you vaccinated to protect others. It appears more and more clear now that the vaccination is very, very useful for protecting individuals, but is, is less useful for protecting other people from that. And that changes a bit the dynamic. And we don't know what's going to happen in terms of future uh, future evolutions or future changes in the virus or in society. But that sort of takes away that imperative because initially the health and safety concern for employers is a, is a strong power. You know, the employers have a legitimate reason to want to control health and safety in their workplace and to not have one of their employees injure another employee intentionally or not. 
Um, you know, there's all sorts of laws about that and wanting to protect employees. Obviously, the, the physical protection of employees are important. But when it's, a, it's an employee's choice uh, and it's the employer impeding on that choice, that's a very different aspect. Uh, nobody in labor law would be very clear, for instance, if the CEO wakes up one day and says, I think drinking is bad for you, um, I'm going to ban everybody in, the, in my company from drinking because drinking is bad notwithstanding any sort of data, I think that generally people in Canadian society would find that abhorrent to impose the personal choice of that CEO on everybody else and to fire people and pay them no severance pay when that happens. So this is a, it's a bit of a shifting uh, aspect. And when these cases eventually go to trial, obviously we're going to be in a different, there's going to be different knowledge about the virus. There's going to be different knowledge about how this thing has progressed during that time which is likely to influence a decision maker. So it's Yeah. It's let's let's talk about the that that example of the teetotaling CEO cuz I think it's it's really interesting. Um just to clarify though what you're saying in in a non-unionized workplace is that uh notionally the CEO could do that they would just owe a lot of severance because because they're you know they they've woken up and decided to impose their their personal morality or you might say their personal personal uh you know choice preferred personal choices with respect to health on on all of their employees uh so you know because it's non-unionized and private sector you know they can they can do that i guess but they have to but then they owe a lot of severance versus a case where where it was more justified from a workplace health and safety perspective yeah generally that's correct i mean leaving aside any sort of say human rights challenge i guess i'm stretching my mind on this one i'm not i'm not sure there's any religions that force you to drink, although there are some religions that take small amounts of alcohol on Sunday, as you know, Garnet. So I think No, no, no. It's it's uh it's it's ceases to be alcohol, but uh but that's a whole that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> well no, yes, I know, but you know, it wouldn't, you know, the, the, so that's the the question I, I was just trying to think if there was any particular there's probably no particular religion that forces people to drink a bottle of wine or something every Thursday. But yeah, outside of any sort of human rights yeah. argument. That's that something would like that would be discriminatory. That's right. Generally, you'd be allowed to terminate people. I mean, example I sometimes give just because I'm originally from Ottawa is you could choose to say, for instance, terminate all the Ottawa Senators fans um, that worked for you just because you don't like them and you like a different team. Again, I'm from Ottawa, so it's not that I hate the Senators. Uh, though now I'm tr- now I'm in Toronto and the Leafs, you know, they're adequate. But you you could do that because it wouldn't be discrimination. But yes, you know, a, you know, a bunch of severance and presumably the market would so- eventually solve your company out of existence because you're yeah. <laughs> making you're making ridiculous choices but that's that's what we expect in Canada is that if companies make bad business choices that the that eventually other companies that don't make bad business choices that they're going to overcome them and take their market share um, and yeah. that's a market based solution rather than a judge stepping in and judges running a, a company or lawyers running a company because that often goes much less well um, as you can imagine yeah. Yeah. So, so I had a um, uh, liberal MP from, from Toronto, Nate Erskine Smith on a few episodes ago, and we were talking about the federal, uh, federal employees vaccine mandate. And um, it was an interesting conversation because I was trying to parse out this distinction between uh, workplace health and safety considerations on the one hand, and, um, and sort of people should all get vaccinated because it's the right thing to do considerations on the other um and and he acknowledged openly that the federal mac vaccine mandate is not just about workplace health and safety because i said okay you got federal employees are working from home they're willing to take rapid tests they're still getting put on leave without pay um so and, and he said yeah it's not just about workplace health and safety it's also about setting an example or whatever so that uh, i guess that that is equivalent to the the um the teetotaling CEO uh, perspective that that uh, a the government in this case or potentially a large firm is trying to kind of shift broader social behavior by requiring something of their employees uh, that they see as being uh, in in the public interest from a from a health perspective, um, but it's not actually about preventing injury on the job. Exactly. And, and that's, and, and that's exactly right. That it's, you know, it is about this higher more like saying vaccination is good and therefore you should do it. And therefore there will be a punishment. And that punishment is that you will lose your job if you don't do it to get the numbers higher in terms of vaccination, which has an effect. And we saw it in the United States as well. 
um, where they initially brought out, I think Joe Biden brought out uh, a mandate uh, and then it was struck down and it's been sort of going through that. I'm not per se an expert in American law, but we do see that as a method. Part of the, the issue though is to some extent, while that actually would have a higher level of legitimacy potentially in the government, where the government is saying, well, listen, we want to have more people get vaccinated. But when an individual is doing it, they're honestly just guessing because they're just, you know, now they're, I don't know, Sony, I'm just picking a company, is choosing for the good of society to, to force their people to get vaccinated. Um, it, it is actually a different and much more questionable uh, exercise of power to some extent. But the questionability on the government becomes that, you know, all of us taxpayers are now paying to have pins since people um, you know, loss of efficiency in the government. So that's a different aspect. But, you know, it is difficult to empower the individual companies to do that. And if you want to do that and have a vaccine mandate, I mean, that isn't something I'm personally supportive of. But if you do, like, it should be coming from the government and should have an ability to have democratic elections where people suffer the consequences or not of bringing in a mandate like that, as opposed to you can't outvote you know, the, the president of, uh, you know, Google Canada or something like that. I mean, I guess you could if you bought enough shares, but it's really just not um, a possible activity. So they don't have the same accountability. And that's yeah. an issue for that. Yeah. So um, the, I, I want to probe the question of discrimination law in a, in a moment, but um, I think you, you've made a really um, interesting point about this distinction between government action and, and private company action. Um, I, I guess, first of all, in the case of the, of the federal public service mandate, I'm using that as, as an example, but that's a unionized workplace. So as we've discussed, uh, individual employees don't have the same remedies in that context because it's these things are negotiated uh, between uh, between government and, and the union. Um, we, we are living through this age of, of kind of growing so-called stakeholder capitalism, right? This idea that uh, that companies uh, shouldn't that some people are pushing, I mean, Mark Carney and others, that that companies shouldn't just uh, be be thinking about uh, maximizing stakeholder, sorry, shareholder value anymore. They should be responding to a broader range of considerations from a broader range of stakeholders. Um, and I think one of the concerns about this is that this is this is kind of the basis on which companies are trying to. Um, uh, promote or punish certain behaviors among their employees, not because of a um, uh, of a workplace health and safety concern, but because they're trying to um, make some broader uh, social point. Is this something that you see, uh, you know, kind of more cases around the kind of stakeholder capitalism, em em employer trying to uh, to uh, do something social to promote some kind of values or oppose others uh, and therefore uh, pushing things on or through their employees? Um, I think the, the most recent example we did have was sort of the Me Too movement in terms of companies, uh, companies who suddenly, you know, trying to defend publicly, um, you know, if there were, if there were complaints against them in a way that they hadn't before. And that was, you know, something, but I, I don't think so. I think that the pandemic, you know, I don't think we've had a lot more other than sort of the Me Too and the pandemic uh, with vaccination. There's not a lot where it results in, for instance, people being terminated um, or, you know, having other than some some complaints here and there. I don't think there is a huge amount. Usually it's fairly outward focused. I think that um, a lot, depending on the company, more of them are worried about retention. So they're taking certain stances because they're worried they're going to lose employees um, if they're not, for instance, suitably green or suitably, um, you know, uh, it, depending, you know, if they're not taking suitable positions, they're worried they're going to lose employees because the employees are going to go someplace else. Um, that's certainly something we see. It's, it's more talked about in the United States where they have a lower uh, unemployment rate. So that way that, you know, there's more of a seen as being more of a fight for retention. So, but I, I wouldn't say that's a, in Canada, at least, I wouldn't say that's a huge issue in terms of the stakeholder capital um, and sort of pushing views onto people minus, you know, I guess a, a few exceptions. Okay. All right. So uh, I know it's been written uh, about, it's being written about increasingly in the United States and, and, and that may, may affect some reflect some dynamics of the labor market um let's talk about this issue of dis discrimination because it's 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 one kind of uh quirk maybe in in a, in in discrimination law it seems to me that that people who who have an objection to doing something on the basis of a protected uh a protected category 
um, you know, they have they have a, an additional set of pr protections compared to people who, um, as a result of maybe convictions that are not religious in nature or um, or another or or or, or you know they they feel they're being discriminated against, but they don't fit into a protected category. They're they're treated differently. Um, I, I hear sometimes from people who've chosen not to get vaccinated, uh, well, it comes out a lot, this, this discourse around saying they're discriminated against, and, and in a sense, they see themselves as, as uh, you know, a group of people who have, who have made a particular choice, have a certain set of concerns as a, as a protected category. Um, but human rights law doesn't, doesn't protect a group of people who have chosen not to get vaccinated. It protects particular categories of people uh, that, that human rights law has sought to um, to identify for protection. Am I getting that right? And, and what's your, what's your thoughts on claims by unvaccinated people to, to form kind of a group analogous to those that, that are protected by human rights uh, codes? Yeah, you have it right. Uh, the human rights doesn't uh, sort of get rid of quote unquote discrimination at large. I mean, every, every time someone hires someone, they, there's some form of you know, little d discrimination going on. You know, I'm going to choose this person over that person because their grades are higher or they presented better in the interview. Um, so that's why the human rights codes protect certain forms of discrimination, one being, um, you know, it's like religion, medical. There are more vague ones, for instance, such as creed. So for instance, non-religious vegetarianism has in Canada found to be uh, a protected ground based on someone's internal belief that the harming of animals is bad, even though it was admittedly not tied to any particular religious belief. So there are some sort of oddities in terms of that, um, but you're not allowed to discriminate against people based on those categories exactly. And it's not just sort of at large. And one of the issues, I think it's to some extent admirable, even if it might be somewhat, you know, you know, in Canada, you know, if some, you know, it's admirable for people that they're not, you know, people are trying to tell the truth and trying to have their situation fit into a category insofar as we don't see something that we've seen a lot more in the States, which is people trying to sort of maybe make up religions. Those religions are anti-vaccination because inherently not um, a terribly high percentage of, of formal organized religions are anti-vaccination. There, there are some, but it's a, it's a fairly small percentage um, of religions. And so, you know, those things come across as being, you know, someone just choosing to join a religion because they are their you know belief in the moment but anyway that, that's a more interesting question to some extent but we haven't really seen a huge resurgence of that um you know i think a lot of people have medical exemptions or what they feel are medical exemptions and initially that was confusing because it was left up to the individual doctors without much guidance as to what's a medical exemption so we'd see people with just notes that are just you know my medical opinion is this person shouldn't get the vaccine just from a doctor without much underlying it and that caused a lot of conflict in the workplace because here you have human resources people deciding what's a legitimate medical note so these sorts of things have caused conflict but now doctors are um, because the medical profession has made it more clear but also extremely limited as to what counts as a medical exemption we're seeing less of that um, overall yeah okay so um this whole question of a religious exemption, for instance, right? So, so let's let's work this analogy on uh, on the teetotaling CEO. Let's work it the other way, right? Like, let's say let's say I I, I run a, a sales company and I I tell my employees you have to go drinking with your clients because that's part of our brand or that's how we 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 build rapport. So if you if you if you refuse to have a few drinks with a client, uh, then you're out, right? Now, clearly, that would, in certain cases, be discrimination on the basis of religion. For instance, if I had uh, uh, Muslim employees, um, yeah, or uh, a Church of Latter Day Saints, uh, any yeah. number of religions, uh, yes. you know, someone who follows, you know, say a Quaker denomination. So, yes, I mean, that would be, you know, on its face, discrimination um, against those individuals. That's right. But, but at this, if if you know, down the hall, I had a, a, a another. So I say, okay, we're going to have accommodations for people who who's religion expressly forbids the consumption of alcohol um but down the hall i have somebody who you know um doesn't have any religious objection uh but you know has has never has never drank and is sort of uncomfortable with it um somebody who maybe has alcoholism in their family and they are kind of nervous about the um the effects of it you know it's it's uh um or or maybe they're 
they're part of a church that does not prohibit the consumption of alcohol, but they personally have some moral objection um, that is that that makes them distinct from their their co-religionists. Uh, that person. Um, who, who, whose every bit is sincere in their feelings or their convictions, uh, they do not have protection or at least not the same protection as the person who can point to uh, to religious text on paper um, that that has a clear prohibition. Is that is that? So I'd say yes. I think Alcoholics Anonymous has been identified as a somewhat religious, so they should just go join AA immediately, and then. Okay. Be, but but yeah, I mean, because that has a there's a religious element to that, and I think it, it Alcoholics Anonymous has been recognized. But yes, theoretically, if the person said it absolutely has nothing to do with religion, I'm not even going to try to make that argument. They would have a worse case. They would have to so sort of go into that. Um, non-religious vegan um a similar legal argument which would be a weaker legal argument i'm not saying it's not impossible um i'm not saying it's, it's impossible sorry but it, it would be weaker than someone who for instance had a you know clearly a religion which said they couldn't drink but that the, the, this is you know to some extent a bit on the aside because the only real difference is whether or not that person would opt to get reinstatement back at a company. And would you like not many employees would actually necessarily want to get reinstatement back at a company where they're going to be treated like that. And that's the culture if they're so against it. So, you know, in any of those instances in a non-unionized environment, that person is going to be getting severance pay though. So, you know, if they just let the person go um, and say that a lot of the time, the discussion would actually be just what sort of a severance package would that employee be getting given those factors, you know, the question of whether or not they could ask for reinstatement before the, say, Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, or the, you know, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, you know, to some extent, in, in a practical perspective, would often actually be, um, you know, you know, would have to often actually be secondary, because most people would instead actually probably choose to just get some sort of package, move to a new job, and go someplace else. I mean, some people wouldn't, but the vast majority of people would. Yeah, but but in that case where someone's not asking for reinstatement, they're they're just asking for a severance. It, um, is it likely that the um, that the um, the the uh, uh, Muslim employee would get a bigger severance package than the um, I don't like alcohol atheist employee? Um, and is is that fair? Um. It's an interesting question. I mean, technically, they would not get. I mean, if you were to go to court, they probably wouldn't get a longer, um, a longer severance package. The the Muslim employee might get, for instance, a uh, human rights damages on top of their severance pay, which a court could award, although okay. they are awarded infrequently, and they are more likely to get that than the non-religious employee. But that's only because the the case is uh, potentially a bit different. That as a society, we've decided that that religious, um, verifiable, sincerely held religious beliefs um, are, um, you know, to be protected more, probably just because to some extent there has been a history of specific discrimination against people yeah. based on religious beliefs in a way that there haven't about people, I don't know, liking purple flags. I don't know, I'm just trying to make up, you know, anyway, Senate, you know, Senate Senators Ottawa Senators, fans, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Ottawa Senators fans, it hasn't been as much of a, a societal issue, you know, there haven't been civil wars fought over uh, hockey teams in a way that they have in some places uh, religious aspects. So yeah. I, I don't know if that's a good policy choice or not. You're the lawmaker, not me, but yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, that's why I think it happens. And, and honestly, I mean, the religious discrimination tends to be, you know, these exceptions where someone is, is like, I am not religious, but I still claim X. It, it's a fairly small percentage. It usually is a conflict yeah. Yeah. The religion. Now, it doesn't have to be, I didn't want to say it doesn't have to be something that's necessarily in the religious text. So it can be sort of derivative. So, you know, for instance, wearing uh, facial coverings um, is not, you know, there's a debate as to whether or not how much of a religious imposition that is versus a cultural one. But those two things are tied together in Canadian law. So you don't actually have to be able to place, you don't have to have, for instance, a rabbi or a priest write a letter and say, this is, you know, you don't have three rabbis for the defense and three rabbis for the prosecution right. um, testifying as to whether or not um, this thing is part of organized religion. It just has to be sincerely held belief by the individual in question. But for instance, for vaccines, it makes it more difficult if the religion that the person says that they're a part of is, is not against yeah. vaccines. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and it's, and it's eminently uh, 
right and fair that the test be individual belief, not correctness of doctrine, because um, you know, because we don't want to put courts in the situation of of adjudicating religious claims, and also courts, um, and also people have a, a a right to to follow their conscience, even if their understandings of of their own religion are are uh, are doctrinally uh, flawed. Um, but it, it does create another set of challenges, which is courts assessing uh, assessing sincerity of of, uh, of belief. Um, I, I, this is this is a, a tangent, but I think it's it's an interesting one. I, I mean, as 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 most people know, I'm a I'm a practicing Catholic, and and for you know for, for me, and I, th I think in general, religion is is important. We're 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 in a, a much less religious society than than either exists around the world or or we've been in historically, and it's interesting to me the way that like other kinds of sort of officially non-religious claims take on more and more importance and status in people's lives as we see the decline of, of religion. So uh, political beliefs, uh, affiliations to, um, to other kinds of things uh, and, and the sort of intensity of feeling on those issues uh, seem to kind of, um, in certain cases, increase in proportion to the, to the decreasing significance in people's lives of, of religion, which suggests that you you have to believe in something, but that has implications for human rights law potentially. If people's, um, if people are still buying into sort of systems of of thought that make uh, normative claims on their lives, and and that these these systems of thought can spawn conflict between groups and potential discrimination, and yet they're they're not officially religious in nature, although they have some of the sort of trappings of religious belief. Um, and and maybe and maybe you could say that that sort of communities of people who have very strong views on certain appropriate responses to the pandemic, um, there's there's a way in which those those the intensity of convictions that exist in certain cases be, becomes sort of quasi religious in nature, uh, even if it's not uh, formally religious. Yeah, I think you know those sorts of quasi religious that that would probably be covered, assuming it was uh, to a certain. Uh, standard. I mean, a religion doesn't have a certain size. You don't have a thousand adherents before you know you count as a religion. But it usually needs to have some sort of um, discernible collective viewpoints uh, within it. So there isn't a you know there's no like cult exception where if you're, you're too small you're out. But you can't just have sort of one person. And where they've gotten a bit further ahead in the United States, and I think probably they would go in Canada, and they have in in some tribunal cases is looking at whether or not, you know, what's happening, you know, is the, is the dog wagging the tail or is the tail wagging the dog? So is the person saying, this is my religious belief because they really have an anti-vaccination belief, let's say using the vaccination example, or are they, is it the other way around? Are they saying that's my religious belief because it's the anti-vaccination or is it really because of their religion? Um, you know, because it isn't also proper just for people to, it wouldn't be proper as a society for people to just sort of say, than anything they want. I, I want a, I want a larger monitor in my office and my religion believes in that, right? And you know, well, you can't go and ask my priest about the larger monitor. Um, you know, you, you, it wouldn't be right to do that. Although, although I do note that sometimes similar things sometimes do tend to happen with medical exemptions. I mean, you can get a doctor to write you a note that you have bad eyesight, so you need a very large monitor. Um, might not work for you, Garnet. I'm sure, I don't know. I'm sure that the Anyway, I'm, I think the speaker's office is a bunch of red tape or something. But in a private, in a private company, you do, do sometimes see medical exemptions like that. But uh, you know, in the case of because they became very common at the beginning, in the case of vaccinations, they do really try to limit it now to people who have gotten negative reactions or have previous history of uh, of um, of so heart uh, heart issues relating to the vaccines so it's harder and harder to get those because the doctors are worried about themselves losing their licenses which is sort of a, a bit of a of a whole question about their um beliefs yeah. and, and the control over the, over the doctors but at the end of the day if you can't get a note you know um as an employee that's the end of it you know it, it's yeah. an interesting question about the control over what what doctors can and can't put down and uh you know, which is a, uh, which is another issue in control of society. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that may be something for a, for a future episode. Cause I think it's a, a, a really interesting issue as, as well. Um, there are a couple technical points that I wanted to just follow up on as, and then we're, 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 we're coming up towards the end here, but um, you know, um, 
first of all, um, the, the federal liberals in the last election, which who went on to form the government, made a promise that they would protect private employers who impose vaccination rules from litigation. Um, we haven't seen any attempt to do this legislatively. Um, I know you've made some comments to the to the media saying that this is uh, probably not possible. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm wondering. This is just one of the things that that you know the Liberal Party says during an election. I won't I won't put words in your mouth uh, on on that. But but what what do you think of this commitment? Is it is it feasible? Um, you know, if if they wanted to, could they do it? Um, um, and what would be the other kind of implications if they tried to? Well, it's, it's probably a really interesting law school exam. If they wanted to, could they do it? I mean, I think it would be politically untenable, it's generally because there's a division of power between the provinces and the federal government, and the provinces have contract law. Generally, that would mean that the, the federal government, the federal liberals, wouldn't be able to impose something like that through normal legislation. So they can't change the Canada Labor Code, which governs federally regulated employees and impose mac, uh, vaccination. They couldn't pass a law saying that there's no liability against employers, let's say. Are there other methods? Well, I mean, theoretically, they could pass a law into the criminal code as an example that would make it illegal for anyone to employ anyone without a vaccine. I think that's a level of draconianness that uh, has not been, um, you know, perceived thus far. But, you know, there are Let's certain not levels. suggest it, though, because... <laughs> Well, this goes back, I mean, I think it was a Jagmeet Singh came out and said it was going to impose a $15 minimum wage um, across the country. And people again asked me the same question, can he do that? And the same answer, well, technically, no, they can only do it as they've now done in the federal sector. But technically, you could pass a criminal law. I mean, the criminal law power is very broad, for instance. Um, right. Anyway, I don't mean to suggest so the, fe the federal government. And this, this is a again an interesting side note. The, the federal government can do you're saying almost anything using the criminal law, but they have to be prepared to go pretty far in terms of criminalizing behavior that would otherwise be regulated by by uh, provincial jurisdiction. That's right. Yeah, they they, they can, and they, there can be fights in the, even in the criminal law power about whether or not you are just really creating some sort of bylaw or provincial law. There are right. There are some fights about that, but the criminal law power is, for instance, one of the broader powers. And we saw that, for instance, in, like, say, like the firearms reference and, and those sorts of uh, right. those sorts of cases the Supreme Court of Canada has come out with. But there are broad jurisdictions for the federal government for, say, peace, order and good government and uh, in terms of emergencies, but also in terms of criminal power. Those are three of the broader areas. But uh, that hasn't been, you know, but theoretically, and anyway, I'm not trying to, now I'm just getting into the, the, the law school exam example. I mean, but there, are, there is an example, for instance, you know, there is a, a usury law on the books where you can't have an interest rate of over 60%, um, you know, which, which is a historical law, but really only affects contracts, right? They don't throw yeah. people in jail for, for signing. I mean, they, they might for, for book, you know, I guess um, loan sharking it's not really something that comes up the vast majority of the time it actually comes up just to invalidate that term in the contract so anyway neither here nor there yeah. i think that it would be uh, you know extremely difficult and subject to court challenge if um if they were to do that and they just, just the federal liberals just literally couldn't legislate from a contract perspective on all the provinces so insofar could, could, could as they, they do that in federal jurisdiction though could they could they um um amend the Canada Labor Code to say that um, that anybody can be fired uh, because of their vaccination status and that person is not entitled to severance could could they could they do that within the 10 percent of the economy that's federally regulated um, I believe they could uh, if they took very certain precautions that I would be reluctant to coach them on. So yeah, please, <laughs> please, please don't. We're not, we're not, we're not but, here to give them ideas. But I, but I am just, I'm curious to know what what is possible legally. Um, I think they could, but again, because there's a common law. So the laws that most employees have, for instance, on severance, do not. The most important laws don't come from. For instance, the Canada Labor Code, they come from the common law, so it's judge-made law. So the government would have to replace that law and they have to do it in an adequate way. And the courts are reluctant to have, unless it's the most clear example, to have the legislature replace things in the common law. Um, 
you know, whether or not that's good or bad, um, but that's uh, that's part of it. And I, we haven't seen any movement towards that as of yet. And I think that with the changes that have happened, I mean, Ontario announced, I think it was yesterday or the day before that they're looking to get rid of vaccine passports um, coming up fairly soon. I know that's also happened already in some of the other provinces. I think that we're trailing away from that. And um, while I'm sure the government doesn't want to look uh, like they're giving concessions in terms of some of the blockades that they, they had that this emergency announcement about. Um, I'm sure that they understand that, you know, a lot of people are looking to return back towards normal. And eventually people are going to look towards the United States and say, you know, if they're open, you know, why can my employee take a holiday to Miami and then, you know, go to a Raptors game there and then come back to Toronto and come to the office the next day. And if we're okay with that as a society, um, you know, some people are going to have those questions. I think it's a legitimate policy question that's going on right now, but that's more your domain yeah. than mine. Yeah. But, you know, I think that that then becomes a political question about what they're going to do about it. It's easier to announce that you're going to do something and then let it trail off sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, and these are obviously important policy questions and ones that I've, I've, uh, I've spoken out on. And I think you're, you're right that um, the, the, the the liberals seem to be sort of contemplating new measures for imposing additional mandates and 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 especially extra squeezes on the unvaccinated at a time when um when provinces as well as other countries around the world are are moving in the opposite direction and, um but let me let me just wrap up with with this final question and about about um kind of, and it relates to what we were just talking about in terms of kind of the moving goalposts and how the circumstances of the of the pandemic are, are dramatically changing all the time, the timelines of litigation. And and I guess one of the things that have come out to me as a sort of an obvious problem with our, um, with our legal frameworks, especially on human rights issues, is just that um, in many cases, laws or, or regulations have been brought in and to the extent that they that they should be adjudicated before the courts, that adjudication doesn't happen until we're already into a a, a different moment uh, of the pandemic with a different set of of regulations. Um, how much is this a problem in Canada that when we're going through a crisis where uh, governments are are making legal changes that have um, that have implications for human rights, that those those things actually aren't adjudicated until the situation is long over anyways uh is there a way to is there a way to say that uh whether it's um restrictions on uh, things like restrictions on public worship whether it's uh vaccine mandates uh, that we could we could construct a system in which we would actually have legal answers to these questions um uh, in in real time rather than people needing to make difficult decisions around their employment and then only finding out a long time afterwards if they had their rights violated or not well, I think that the Canadian system has done uh, quite well in some aspects. Like, so for instance, you know, in Ottawa, there was a class action and they were able to have, you know, representatives of the protesters and representatives um, of the community show up in front of a judge and make arguments. And they were able to agree to certain, um, certain agreements, you know, for instance, horns during certain times. And that was able to move quite quickly. And so the Canadian judicial system is able to select certain cases and move them along very quickly. The problem is the vast majority of cases, right? So even if you pick one or two cases, if there's, you know, a thousand that are taking two, three years to go forward, that has an impact on, on those individuals. Often, um, so, I mean, I think it is an issue that needs to be dealt with. It, Canada doesn't rank particularly well, and for instance, in terms of the ease of doing business, in terms of how long it takes to enforce um, contracts, and I think that could be improved. Um, it is something where, you know, I'm part of the Ontario Bar Association in, term, in the labor and employment, and they work with the judici judiciary in terms of trying to move that ahead. I do think that Canada could be faster. The tribunal system itself, though, um, is, you know, the tribunals are sort of a different thing, and they've had a much harder time responding quickly. And, um, you know, I think that's partially there, you know, they're overwhelmed in the tribunal system. I mean, simple things, it doesn't cost anything, for instance, to even file a claim before a human rights tribunal. And that leads to a huge overwhelming, um, an overwhelming uh, number of cases. Whereas, you know, even with a fairly low charge um, in the court system, in being in terms of being able to file a case really does weed out a lot of those instances. And if someone doesn't have the money to pay, they can always fill out basically a legal aid fee waiver in any event. Uh -huh. But the ability to file a human rights claim 
almost as easily as sending an email has some potential downsides in terms of them just being swamped with cases and unable to even identify the ones that could be sort of fast tracked forward in a way that the um, the superior court can. So I think that there's, you know, there are some instances there where, you know, it's part of the setup. You get, you theoretically get access to justice, but by enabling, trying to enable access to justice, you actually swamp the system and eliminate justice for the vast majority of people. Um, and really cause additional delays. So I think that that's a particular problem in the human rights context. Um, you know, there's other sort of logistical issues there as well in terms of appointments and getting good people and having the, the vice chairs and the uh, adjudicators available and uh, consistent over a long period of time. But there are, you know, a number of things that need to be worked on, I guess. Um, but, you know, it's it's every like everything in the pandemic, we all just try and do our best, right? Uh, you yeah. know, I didn't expect to be you know, homeschooling my kids either. But, you know, that's, you know, that's where we're at. We're all wearing many hats these days. Yes. Well, thank you for uh, wearing the hat of guest on my podcast today, uh, Andrew. It's so, so good to catch up with you. And um, your, uh, your thinking is, is, uh, is as sharp as it was uh, in those uh, heady days of, uh, of campus politics at, uh, at Carleton. And uh, um and uh, yeah, I, I think our listeners are, are going to really appreciate the insights you've been able to share. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, we've been able to talk about, I think, what is a very uh, sensitive political issue uh, in a way that just is providing people with a lot of very good technical information to understand um, how the law operates in, in various situations. So, uh, so thanks so much uh, for taking the time and, uh, and uh, appreciate having you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. And uh, for all of you listeners out there, we'll be, we'll be back with another episode in seven days. Uh, leave a review, uh, share this uh, with your, your friends and family. I think uh, this episode in particular uh, has lots of, of, of great information that people will want to have. Um, but, uh, but there's lots of other, other great episodes we have on, on, on various topics, uh, on, uh, on other aspects of pandemic policy, on the, uh, on the situation uh, in, in Russia and Ukraine, uh, and, uh, and many other emerging, emerging policy issues. So, so please leave a review for Resuming Debate and, uh, and follow the podcast so that you don't ever miss uh, uh, another episode. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.